Good day to everybody again. Today we are going to talk about tanks. And you'll notice the subtitle says, Does it really matter what size I use? And you're going to find the answer to that as we finish our webinar. When you look at the water tower that's there right now, you have to think there's thousands, and of course some of these water towers get so big, you wonder if there's millions of gallons of water in that tank. And so because people see those great big water towers, they think that tanks are there for water only. And the bottom line is, that's only half the truth. The real reason that this great big ball is up there, pressure. Water towers are really pressure vessels. Okay? For example, 115 feet of water above the ground, well, if you take 115, divide it by 2.31, you're going to get about 50 PSI at ground level. So anybody that's level with that ground or, or below that level area, as a matter of fact, they get even more pressure. All right, I'll give you an example. Uh, our water tower where I live is uh, about, oh, maybe half mile up from my house, and it's up a hill. So at my house, we're getting 70 PSI. The guy at the bottom of the hill, he's got to put a pressure reducer on his system because of the fact that the pressure gets well over 100 PSI. So you, you have to stop and realize that what we're looking at when we call this a city water tower, what we're really looking at is a pressure vessel. All right. Now, of course, it'd be nice if everybody had a, a water tower in their backyard. Well, okay, maybe that wouldn't be so nice. So to eliminate the need for a water tower, what the industry came up with was an air over water tank. And then eventually down the line, they came up with what's called a precharged tank. And we're going to take a look at those now. Okay, sort them out a little bit more. So some similarities. Air over water tank is on the left-hand side. The precharged tank is on the right-hand side. All right. Similarities, they've both got a pressure switch. Okay, They both have a pressure gauge. At least we encourage people to put a pressure gauge in there. They're both going to have a pressure relief valve. And again, something that we encourage people to do is always put a pressure relief valve in. This is where there starts to be some differences. In the air over water tank, you're going to have what is called an air volume control. Now, an air volume control does exactly what the name suggests. It controls the amount of air in that tank. All right? If it is an above-ground pump, it's got an air volume control tube that connects the little cup to the front of the pump. Now, I've got a question for you, and my question is this. Is an air over water tank more than half the size of a precharged tank? And the answer, yes. A 220-gallon air over water tank holds 220 gallons of water with no air in it. An 85-gallon precharged tank only holds 85 gallons of water if you let the precharge out. However, both of them have a drawdown of 26 gallons. So they do the same work, but you can see the 220 is more than twice the size of the 85. We'll take a closer look at that even. So we start out looking at this. This is my rendition of a 220 gallon air over water tank. Again, remember, with no air in that tank, it will hold 220 gallons of water. All right? Now, we're going to put a 3050 pressure switch on it. And I'm going to tell you that I'm even though there's no dividers in there, and there are no dividers in there, I'm going to divide this up into three separate sections. Drawdown is the first section. Drawdown is the amount of water that you're going to get out of that tank between 30 PSI when the pump turns on and 50 PSI when the pump turns off. So when the pump turns off till it turns back on again, that's how much water you've got in the tank. We call that drawdown. That's your drawdown water. All right, compression water. We learn in hydraulics that water is non-compressible. Okay, you cannot compress water. But 
you can use this water here, we call it compression water, to compress the air that is in the tank. Now, here's what happens next. Air and water molecules are very similar. So the air molecules attach themselves to the water molecules and watch what happens when that does. Okay, You'll notice that as your air disappears, so does your drawdown. And once all the air is gone, what do you call that? Everybody says it's a waterlogged tank. So you're right. you got a waterlogged tank. Now the next question I've got for you is this. What is the real name for a waterlogged tank? The answer, a big piece of pipe. That's all that it is in the system. It's just a big piece of pipe. All right? So we're going to go back to our air in there and, and get this all squared away. And now we're going to take a look at another thing here. Okay? Remember we said that there was drawdown. The drawdown in a 220-gallon air-over-water tank with a 3050 pressure switch is going to be 26 gallons. All right? Now remember we said that an 85-gallon tank does the same thing. It's got the same type of things in there, so there's got to be three things in there. Instead of having compression water, though, we've got a separator. All right, that separator separates the drawdown water from the air. Of course, what that means is we can make this an 85 gallon tank because we separated the air from the uh, water. Now, by doing so, what that means is you, have, you are less likely to lose air in the tank. I'm not going to say you won't lose it, but it'll take a lot longer to lose that uh, air in the tank. And so because of that, you don't have to worry about it so much. And what have we got here? Well, we've got 220 gallons divided into 85 gallons gives us 38%. So an 85-gallon tank is only 38% of the size of a 220. Is that less than half? Yes, it is. Even your 19-gallon tank is equivalent to a 42 air over water, which makes it 45%. So a 19-gallon tank is 45% of its equivalent air over water tank. Now, next thing we're going to do here, we're going to divide... 26 by 220. That's going to tell us what percentage of water, excuse me, that's going to tell us what percentage of that tank is drawdown water. And that percentage is almost 12, 11.8%. Now I want you to know this formula is a good formula. You can use this formula on any tank. So if you take the uh, tank, the air over water tank, and you know the exact size of the air over water tank, you can take it times 11.8 and you'll be pretty close to how much drawdown there is in that tank. All right. When you've got a precharged tank, the formula stays the same, but you're going to find that you're only taking 26 divided by 85 now, which is 30.5%. So if you're using a 3050 pressure switch, and here's the key, has to be a 3050 pressure switch. If you're using a 3050 pressure switch and you know the exact size of the tank, you can calculate the drawdown by multiplying the 30 and a half times the actual size of the tank. A lot of people today, though, like to use that 4060 pressure switch. And remember, a 4060 pressure switch, because I'm putting more pressure in the tank, I get less drawdown, so it's only 22 gallons. Take 22 gallons, divide it by uh, 220, and it's only 10%. You take 22 gallons, divide it by 85, and you're at 25.8%. So again, you take those numbers, that percentage, multiply it by whatever size tank you've got. If you've got a 4060 pressure switch, that'll give you the drawdown number. Now again, I want to remind you, our question was, does it really matter how much drawdown is in there? And the answer is yes, so let's take a look and see. 
we're going to talk a little bit about across the line starting. Across the line starting means I'm using a pressure switch, and when that pressure switch closes, it turns my pump on. When the pressure switch opens, it turns my pump off. I've been in the industry for 43 years. I have been training for 24 of those 43 years. And I know a lot of people who still believe today that what was taught to us years ago, a one minute run time, is what you need. If you can get a one minute run time out of a pump, then you're okay. All right? Now, of course, one minute run time. Let's take a look here. We're in the PN793 and I'm on page 24. I want you to know Franklin has a very similar chart in their AIM manual. Okay? I said similar, not the same. We're talking here at 5.10, which is about starting frequency. Now, notice over here it says horsepower, then it says single phase. We're going to look at the half and three quarter horsepower only. In a 24 hour period, you should not start that motor more than 300 times. Franklin says the exact same thing. And I'm pretty sure Google says the exact same thing. Anybody that makes motors is going to tell you half and three quarter horsepower, 300 starts in a 24 hour period. Okay? Now, of course, Franklin says day, and that confused a guy one time. And, you know, he called me up and he says, I'm running a 50 horsepower pump. And he says, I've burned up two motors. He said, I'm staying within my starts for the day, so what's the problem? Now, this is back in the day when we were still selling Franklin motors. So I got out my Franklin A manual, and I looked at it, and it said, anything over... 10 horsepower, 100 starts a day. 100 starts a day. If you take that 100 starts a day and divide it by the 24 hours, that's about one start every 15 minutes. I said, are you talking a 24-hour day? And he says, well, no, it's an 8-hour work day. So he's thinking in his mind we're staying within our 100 starts for the day, but he's taking all 100 starts and cramming them into 8 hours. Well, if you divide 100 into 8 hours, you're only looking at one start every 5 minutes, not every 15 minutes. Now, of course, basically what happens is happening is this. As you heat that motor up, it has to dissipate that heat. And if you don't let it cool off or run long enough, it's not going to dissipate the heat. And then, of course, you start it again, it builds up more heat, and then more heat and more heat, and pretty soon you burn up motors. Okay, so 300 starts a day, 300 divided by 24 is 12.5. So you'll notice here we're going to suggest no more than 12.5 starts an hour. And of course, if you break that down to cycle time, 12.5 starts into, into one hour is going to equal 4.8 minutes. So about one start every five minutes is what we're recommending. All right. Now, notice if you have a 1 through 5 horsepower pump, you're down to 100 starts a day. Remember what I said, 100 starts a day is going to be 4.2 starts an hour or about 1 start every 15 minutes. Those of you that are running 1 horsepower or larger single phase motors, uh, let me ask you a question. Of course, it's a rhetorical question. You can't answer me anyway. And the question is, are you getting only one start every 15 minutes? Now, <clears throat> to prove my point, we're going to look here. It says starting frequency. Notice why we want to make sure our starting frequency is where it belongs. Recommended motor starting frequency is shown below. Motor, pressure switch, tank, and pump life may be extended it by limiting the hour the starts per hour and starts per day proper tank sizing is critical to control pump cycle times excessive or rapid cycling creates heat which can permanently damage the motor switches and controls okay so that's why 
making sure that you get the right amount of runtime on that pump is so important. All right? Remember what has been said for over 24 years. Drawdown should be equal to one minute runtime. And I want you to know, even though we've said that for 24 years, the further we seem to get away from that 24 years, the worse it seems to get. Everybody wants cheap. So they were going to go smaller and smaller, and they put in smaller tanks all the time. So we're going to ask this question. How much water would a half-horsepower 10-gallon-a-minute pump set at 50 feet to water with a 30-50 pressure switch on it pump? Okay? So you have to remember that 30 PSI is the on pressure on that switch, which means when the switch drops down and turns on, there should still be 70 feet of head against that pump. Add that 70 feet of head to the 50 feet of water, and you've got 120 feet. Now, here's my ground level. Someplace under that ground is my water table. I put a well down through there. The water in the well should be equal to the water outside the well. At the bottom of that well, I'm going to put a screen to try and keep the big particles out, and then I'm going to go ahead and put my pump in. My pump will come to the surface and eventually go over to my point of usage. My point of usage, the tank. Someplace right there by the tank, I'm going to put a pressure switch. That pressure switch is a 3050 pressure switch, which is equal to 70 feet of head of back pressure on that pump. I've got 50 actual feet of lift, so the bottom line is we're looking at 120 feet. This is a 10 gallon a minute pump performance curve. Now I picked 10 gallons a minute because it's one of the most popular pumps sold. All right. I'm going to blow it up a little bit so you can see it bigger because we don't need to see the whole thing. We just need to see this part here, which makes putting in a line at 120 feet a little easier. Okay. So we put that line at 120 feet. You'll notice the very bottom curve is the half horsepower curve, which is the one we're talking about. And, of course, if you look carefully, you're going to see where the 120-foot line crosses the half-horsepower curve, we're right around 11 and a half gallons a minute. I'm going to be very generous, and I'm going to say 11 gallons a minute. You'll see why I'm being generous here in a minute. So, when you ask that question, how much is it going to pump? It's going to pump 11 gallons a minute. Now, how many of you have seen this situation. They'll take the exact same application I'm talking about, but they're going to put a horse and a half pump in. Why? Well, a horse and a half pump is bigger. It'll do more. Okay? So let's see what that horse and a half pump is going to do. First of all, notice there's your horse and a half pump right there. If we follow that curve down, you can see that at 120 feet, we're doing approximately 15 and a half gallons a minute. Now, the point that I want to make is this. The off pressure is 20 PSI difference from the on pressure. 20 PSI is about 47 feet. So, I move up 47 feet on that curve, and it puts me right about there. You will notice that the difference between the on pressure and the off pressure, as far as flow is concerned, is about one gallon a minute. But there's something more important taking place here. Notice that you are about halfway on one side of that dotted line. 15 gallons a minute is the dotted line, where the dotted line starts, and it goes right from there. And my guess is, looking at the two, you're about halfway on one side and halfway on the other side of the 15 gallons a minute. The point being is, the dotted line means you are up thrusting the pump. Which means every time you turn this pump on, you're up thrusting it for half the time that it's on. Okay? Now, of course, we're going to go down a little bit. We'll call it 15 gallons a minute instead of 15 and a half. And again, the only reason I'm doing it is it makes the math a lot easier. 
Okay. So I got another question for you here. The most popular tank sold in the United States is the 19-gallon pre-charge tank. Why? It's one of the cheapest ones. Okay. So we're going to go back. Remember, we're talking about across the line starting. We're talking about that 19-gallon pre-charge tank. A 19-gallon pre-charge tank with a 3050 pressure switch has a drawdown, remember the math here, of 5.8 gallons. So I take 30.5% times my 19 gallons, and I get 5.8 gallons, almost 6 gallons of drawdown. Okay? What would the run time on my half-horsepower pump be then? So if my half horsepower pump is doing 11 gallons a minute, I'm being generous, remember, and my tank can only hold 5.8, it means that I'm getting a 32-second run time. 32-second run time. And you're thinking, wow, that's nowhere near a minute. You'd be right. You'd be right. It's not anywhere near a minute. But if you think that's bad, think of the idiot that puts in the horse and the half pump. All right, because when he puts in that horse and a half pump, 5.8 divided by 15, 20 seconds. 20 seconds of run time. That's it. Then he's done. Okay? So this is why tank sizing is so important. This is why I get a little on my high horse when I start talking about tank sizing. I had these guys come down one time and they said, oh, tank sizing doesn't make any difference. The life of the pump is the life of the pump. I was taught something one time called toifing. Toifing means thinking on your feet. So I shot a question back to them. I said, you really believe that, don't you? And they said, well, it's true. Why wouldn't we believe it? So I said, okay, answer me this question. Are you in the business to make money? Now, that's a silly question because the answer has to be yes. Otherwise, why would you be in the business? Okay, so you're in the business to make money. Do you make more money on a large tank or a small tank? And again, that should be a pretty obvious answer. If you're making more money on a small tank, you really don't know how to sell. So the bottom line is, you're in the business to make money, and you make more money on a big tank. Why are you then selling the small tank? If you don't want to believe me when I tell you that a small tank is undersized and it's going to hurt the life of the system, then think of it in terms of money. Because if you put the small tank in, you're not making as much money. And you know what? That little grin that they had on their face because they thought they were being smart went away. It went away. Okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about VFDs in tanks. VFDs is variable frequency drives. Things change with tanks when you've got a variable frequency drive on there. First of all, tank sizing changes. All right, instead of having to worry about that one minute runtime, all I have to worry about is is my tank 20% of the rate of flow of the pump or a minimum of five gallon tank? Now, remember when we're saying a minimum of five gallon tank, we are not talking drawdown, we're talking the actual size of the tank. Okay. This chart is found in the PN793, it's table number 6, and it's under the variable frequency drive PID controls. The chart shows you that basically when you're doing a drive, this is what you want to do as far as pressure in the tank. You want to take whatever your set point pressure is and multiply it by 0.7. Remember before we said 30.5% was water, that makes 70% air. So if you set the precharge so 70% is air, you're, you're going to get about what you should be getting out of that tank. All right? Now, of course, what that means is what would the pr uh, pressure be set in the tank at if I was running a 60 pound precharge? And the answer is 60 times 0.7, 42 psi. So in my tank, I need to keep 42 PSI to make it do what I want it to do. Now we're going to take a look at air over water tanks. And remember, you have to replenish the air in the tank when you have an air over water tank. There's two different types of pumps that we use. We use a uh, centrifugal type pump, above ground pump, 
and we also use a submersible pump. So the two pumps are different, and therefore you have two different air volume controls. The air volume control for the above ground pump, normal operation looks like this. The amount of water in the tank is equal to the amount of water in the little cup there. Now, of course, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is you're going to get air and water to mix, and as the air and water mixes, the next time the pump turns on, you get a little more water in there, and so now you're going to have that water spill over into the cup. You'll notice there's a little ball right there. That little ball floats up, allows the water to down, drip down through the hole, and it raises that big ball up. Now, what happens next is this. We get some movement, all right? The pump turns on, and when the pump turns on, it draws a vacuum on that tube that went from the plastic cup to the front of the pump. As it does that, you'll notice that the big ball floats down in the water. The little ball gets pulled down over that hole and stops the flow of water, and then, of course, air gets pulled in through the AVC. Now what happens next? What happens next is this. When the pump turns off, the air is trapped inside the cup. The air has gotten pulled inside this cup. So the air is trapped inside the cup. It can't go back out where it came from. So what happens now, there's no vacuum on this thing. So of course, the air pushes up. The water comes up from the from the bottom because remember it's going to equal itself out and of course as it does that it's going to push that air into the tank. This ball comes up, that ball goes up and all this air here gets pushed right into the tank. Okay? And we start the process over again. If you're doing a submersible pump things are a little different. With a submersible pump, what you're going to use is something called a bleeder orifice. Now, some people use one, some people use two. I don't care. You're also going to have a check valve near the top of the well. All right? And the reason for that is because what's going to happen, that bleeder orifice has a little ball in it, and when the pump is turned off, there's not a whole lot of pressure on the system. So that little ball kind of floats up and allows water to drip out of the pipe. So you're going to fill the pipe from the bottom bleeder orifice all the way up to the check valve. You're going to fill it with air. When the pump turns on, the water is going to push against that little uh, ball that's there, push it tight against the hole and close it, and now it's going to push all that air right up into the tank. As the air goes up in the tank, water comes out. With the water coming out of the tank, that means that you can trap more air in the tank than what the tank needs. So how do you get rid of it? This is called a Robert Shaw. It's a special air volume control that is designed to work with submersible pumps. It's got a paddle on it, and as the air fills up the cavity and the water starts to drop out, the weight of that paddle comes down, it opens up a snifter valve right here, and you hear air escaping. They make a lot of noise, trust me. Okay. Now that noise continues to, to be made until the uh, pressure in the tank, the water pressure in the tank, pushes up on the Robert Shaw and closes that snifter valve. Once the snifter valve is closed, you start the process over again. Precharge tanks. This is a precharge tank here. When you look at this precharge tank, you're going to notice we use a bag. All right. Some people use a diaphragm. We use a bag doesn't matter whichever one you want to use okay now here's the point to keep that bag in place here because we we, we we want to fill the bag with water that's why we call it a bladder because it gets water in it to fill that bag with water and keep it safe we put in something called a standpipe now I want you to know when we very 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 first started doing this and that's got to be oh many 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 years ago 
okay? What happened was the bag would get sucked into the standpipe because there was a pressure differential there, okay? So the bottom line is that wasn't good, so what we did was we put a little rubber cap over the top of the standpipe, and then we drilled a hole down the bottom of it so that way the pressure could equal out. And by equalizing that pressure out, we stopped that bag from getting pulled into the standpipe. What happens next is this. When the tank is completely full of water, as far as we can push, okay, now remember, we're running a 30-50 pressure switch or a 40-60 pressure switch, so when that pressure in the tank is up to 60 PSI, it pushes back on that pressure switch and turns it off. Now it's the air in the tank that continues to push against that bag until the water's all out. And then it turns on, and we start the process all over again. All right? So we sell two types of steel tanks. One is called ProSource. ProSource means that we're going to have a rubber snifter valve underneath that cap. So there'll be a rubber snifter valve. And a plastic flange. Now, these are ProSource Plus tanks. The difference between the ProSource and the ProSource Plus, besides the fact the ProSource Plus has a, has a uh, smaller selection, it also uses a steel snifter valve. And it uses a stainless steel flange on the bottom. All right? Now, this is an artist's conception of what's taking place inside the tank. So the pump turns on, pushes water into the bag, the bag expands, the bag expands, it compresses the gas that's in there, air, all right? As that uh, bag finally turns off, because the pump turns off, so the bag stops filling, now the air pressure pushes against the bag, forcing the water out of it. And you can see this is a very easy way for it to recycle, okay? True or false? Bigger is better when it comes to tank sizing. Now, if you said true, you'd be right. Okay? Now, that being said, this is a chart A. This chart A is found in the S4500 WS Stay Right Catalog, page 116. You'll also find it in the Berkeley Catalog, and you'll also find it in the Myers Catalog. Okay? Now, a couple things about the chart. Okay, it's called chart A, and you can see it's got a 2040, a 3050, or a 4060 pressure switch on it. All right, right underneath that it says run times, and it gives you an option of a one minute or a two minute run time. I'm always going to recommend a two minute run time. Over on the left hand side it gives you flow in gallons per minute, and then it says there's your 10 gallon a minute pump. All right, so you look here and it says, okay, 10 gallons a minute, I can get away with a, I can get away with a PSP 35. All right, so I can, I can use a 35 gallon tank here. That's for a one minute run time. And I'm going to tell you right now that while I truly believe in a two minute run time, if I can get you to do a one minute run time, I'm happy. Because you saw in our example, all these people out here that have that 20 second or 30 second run time. So if I can get to do a minute, I feel pretty good. Now, of course, if you want that two minute run time, you're going to use a PSP 62. All right. You'll notice that if you go down, there are some uh, pipe uh, tank sizes in parentheses. The parentheses simply means you're going to use two of those tanks. Or if you get over that PSP 85 at 50 gallons a minute, on a two-minute run time, they're going to say use five of them. Okay? Now, some people ask me then, well, if you don't want me to use that 19-gallon tank, why do you make it? And the answer is very simple. I make a five-gallon pump. So why wouldn't I make a five-gallon tank? Just because I make a five-gallon tank doesn't mean that you have to use it. Pick the right tank for the job. Bigger is better. All right? Another place that you can find a good ordering information is on page 115 in the, P, in the uh, S4500WS. 
Now remember again, it's also going to be in the Berkeley catalog and the state and the uh, Myers condensed catalog. On page 115 here it says ordering information, and then it says catalog number, maximum capacity in liters or gallons per minute. So this is the actual size of the tank. Then it gives you the dimensions, diameter, height, precharge, and connection size, female. Then it gives you the drawdown in gallons or liters per minute at whatever one of those three switches you're working on. So if we go to the 3050 pressure switch there and we say, I want this thing to run for at least uh, a minute, okay, you'll notice there 10.7 and 40.5 uh, liters. So 10.7 gallon or 40.5 liters is the tank size that I want. And of course if I go all the way over to the left hand side it's a PSP 35-T05. So that's how you use these charts. All right. Remember bigger is better. If one tank is good, two tanks are even better. All right. Now the next thing we're going to look at here is the house system. When you look at the house system, you're going to notice that we've got a pump and motor down in the well. All right? We've got electric cable that brings the power down to that motor. That electric cable quite often is taped to the piping system so as not to fly around too much, not to get into too much problems. See, the thing is, if you break one of those wires, you're either going to fault out on uh, over volt or over amperage or you're going to fault out on the fact that you've got an open line so the bottom line is it's not good so you want to keep that line taped to the pipe to make sure that it stays where you want it to stay all right now to help it stay where you want it to stay make sure you put in a torque arrestor we'll even recommend centering guides okay then we'll tell you, don't forget check valves. Don't forget check valves. All right. If you go back to that torque arrestor for just a second, remember what the job of the torque arrestor is. It arrests torque. So it's to prevent that pump from spinning. Because when the pump is hanging there just from the pipe, it wants to spin on that pipe. So if you're not putting a pipe in there that's left-hand threads, it's going to unscrew the pipe. That's why it's really, really important that you understand you're putting a torque arrestor in there to protect your system. Okay? Check valves, we said every 200 feet. Pitless adapter, it all depends on where you live as to whether you're going to use a pitless adapter or not. If you live where I do in Wisconsin, you're going to use a pitless adapter. Why? Because if you don't lose a, use a pitless adapter, you don't have water in the wintertime. Okay? The pitless adapter is nothing more than a special elbow that takes the water from the vertical to the horizontal under the frost line. That's the important thing. It's under the frost line. All right? Now, a well cap, you want to make sure that you choose a good well cap preferably a well cap that is ventilated. Some people want to think that once you get in the house, the disconnect switch is your first piece of equipment. It's not. Your first piece of equipment is that main breaker box. When you measure wire size, or go to size the wire for the, for the pump, make sure that you measure from the main breaker box to the disconnect switch. Then you go from the disconnect switch to the pressure switch, and from the pressure switch back up to the control box, if you're using a three-wire motor. If you're using a two-wire, you just go right down the well. Now, the next thing we've got here is our pressure tank, our pressure vessel here. And I'm going to just tell you this. I call it pre-charged. I had a guy tell me one time, you can't call that pre-charged. I said, why not? He says, because you can pre-charge any tank. I said, oh, really? I said, are you trying to tell me that you can pre-charge an air-over-water tank? He says, that's right. And I said, when it's not hooked up to the system, because the bottom line is, if the pump's not hooked up to the system, then you're not getting anything. You 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 have a, a tank with the, that's got air in it, but no water. So when you want to hook it up to the system, what's the first thing you got to do? Let all the air out so you can put the piping in. 
okay? So I'm going to call this a pre-charged tank because when it leaves my factory, it's got a charge of air in it. When you get it, you need to check and make sure that that pre-charge is correct, all right? Now I'm going to tell you another little secret. You're going to want to make sure there's a drain cock on that uh, tank T, okay? The reason you want the drain cock on the tank T is simply because of the fact that if you don't have the drain cock on the tank T, how do you drain out the system so that way you eliminate the pressure? Now, some people want to use that drain cock as a way of getting a test for the water. And it's okay as long as you follow local codes. So know what your local code says about that. A lot of local codes say, hey, you got to be at least, at least a, uh, a foot above that uh, floor before you can take a sample. So make sure you know what yours says, all right? The other use for that drain cock is checking the pre-charge. In our warranty, it very clearly states that this warranty should, that this uh, pre-charge should be checked once every six months. And of course, I want to tell you the truth. I'm a pretty generous guy. If you live in Wisconsin, you want to check it once a year, I'm okay. I'm okay with that. Why? Because your tank is more than likely in the basement. Now, if you're in Florida or southern Texas, Mississippi, Louisiana, southern California, the highlands of uh, Arizona, you might put that tank right out in the sun. And I'm going to tell you that's one of the worst things you can do, but you might do it anyway. All right? The point being is this. When you put that tank out in the sun... What happens is the sun beats down on the tank, and of course it warms up the air on the inside. The air on the inside expands, which means I've got more pressure than what I was planning on. So now I've got to change my pressure in my tank down to about 25 pounds. Instead of taking 2 pounds out, I'll want to take 5 pounds below the cut-in. Okay? Now the next thing that's here is our pressure gauge because a lot of people like to think what is the pressure in my system i tell you the truth we had a uh, we have a, a lady that works here her name is nancy and nancy really believed us when we told her that you know you need to check that pressure so she checked the pressure in her tank found out there was none so she called a company they came out and they replaced the tank for her like she asked but she got home that night and found out there was still 40 pounds of pressure in the tank and she said well that's not what it's supposed to be. I'm running a 3050 pressure switch. I should only have 28 pounds of pressure in there. And when she called the guy and told him that, he says, oh, those factory people, they don't know what they're talking about. And she said, I'm one of those factory people. And if you don't change this, I'm not paying you. So the guy's daughter came out the next day and reset the pre-charge to make sure that it was right. Okay? Now, the point being is if that pre-charge isn't right, you're going to have a problem. You're going to shorten the life of the system. You're going to wind up with short cycling the pump. And of course, as you short cycle the pump, you create a lot of heat. All right? Every time that pump turns on, there's heat on that pressure switch, there's heat on that control box, there's heat on the disconnect switch, there's heat on the motor. And if you don't dissipate it enough, you will burn it up eventually. All right? Now, the last thing that we're talking about here is a pressure relief valve. And I always tell people the pressure relief valve is the cheapest insurance policy you will ever purchase. Now, why do I say that? Because if you've got a tank and you didn't put a pressure relief valve in and somehow or another that pressure switch stuck shut and wouldn't turn off, this is what could happen. Now, if it just blew out the bottom, you're talking some flooding and, you know, things like that that might not hurt anything too much. Although I heard of a guy one time who had a tank in his garage, and when the tank blew up, it went up through one side of the garage, came down through the other side of the garage, and now he not only had a bad tank, but he had two holes in his roof of his garage, too. That was down in Florida, by the way. All right? This is another application. The tank that was in here was found 200 feet away over there in the street. 200 feet away. 
imagine what would happen if you would have been in that blockhouse when it blew up. Nancy and I went to uh, South Carolina one time, and while I was doing the presentation on tanks, there was a couple guys up front kind of whispering back and forth to one another, and so I walked over by them and said, want to share? And they said, well, did you hear about what happened over in Asheville on Sunday? And I said, no, I didn't. And he, they said, well, there was a tank over there that froze up, and of course the incoming water, because the, everything was froze, the incoming water froze and they had no water. So he's thawing it out, not realizing that the pump is still pumping. And when that hot water from that pump hit that cold iceberg in that tank, it created so much steam, the thing blew up and killed the guy. So the bottom line is, watching your tank size is extremely important. Get that runtime right. Remember, we'd like to see a one minute runtime minimum and I'm going to tell you a two minute runtime is better and when you get into anything over one horsepower by God if you can get a five minute runtime you're even you're helping yourself a lot all right any questions if there are please send them to training.institute at pentair.com